So last time, what we did was uh, we talked a little bit about what? Well, we talked a little bit about uh, some closed systems uh, before this and entropy, uh, solving for uh, entropy change, right? This is the question we did. This was work and heat transfer for an internally reversible process for water, right? So we did this section right here, talking about the Carnot cycle in terms of entropy. And we were introduced to the phrase isentropic. Somebody tell me, what does isentropic mean? 10 points for Gryffindor, if you can get it done in the next 10 seconds. No change to um, entropy. entropy. Yes, correct, no change in entropy. Uh, you almost let Slytherin win, but you were there at the right last second. So, that is what we have talked about. Now we are going to do something a little different here. So right here, entropy production is a term that we are adding to the equation that we already know, right? We knew this equation, right? This is the one that we did in the last section, correct? That very last step in that example problem. Uh, if we go back up here, if you recall, that's how they solved. That's how, this, this equation is how they solved. Uh, uh, they just re-maneuvered it around, but essentially that's how they solved for uh, the heat transfer, right? But a rearranging of this equation gets you the one down there as well. So this right here. And so closed system entropy balance is right here, but now we have added this term to it. So we'll talk about that in just a second. So it says, in this section, we begin our study of the entropy balance. The entropy balance is an expression of the second law that is particularly effective for thermodynamic analysis. The current presentation is limited to closed systems. The entropy balance is extended to control volumes in the next section in 6.9, not the next one, the one after. Just as mass and energy are accounted for by mass and energy balances, respectively, entropy is accounted for by an entropy balance. In equation 5.2, the entropy balance is introduced in words. So let's read these. It says, change in the amount of entropy contained within a system during the interval. So tell me, what is this one right here? I know uh, it says right below us. But right here, what, what would I put as a symbol for this? Tanner, are you here? Change in the amount of entropy contained within the system during some time interval. What would we say? Anyone else want to go? Tanner's got it, looks like. Delta S, correct. So this would be delta S. We're going to construct the equation here. Is equal to net amount of entropy transferred in across the system boundary during the time interval. So which one would this be? So this is entropy transferred in. And entropy is always, so what, what right here, I know you're probably gonna give me the right answer. No, I'm giving, I'll ask you again, uh, but Remember, there was something we mentioned in the previous section that said that something or entropy is always accompanied by an, a transfer of what? Transfer of heat. Transfer of heat, that is correct. So this right here would be Q, uh, I think it has it over T uh, boundary or something to that effect. And then the last one is amount of entropy produced within the system during the time interval. And so I've been uh, destroy I've been, you know, smacking this into your head for a while. Uh, and yes, you are correct. It should be from one to two. Um, that's sigma, correct. And that is entropy produced. And so that constructs the equation, right? So we have entropy change is equal to the amount of entropy added to the system or the net amount transferred in across the boundary from heat transfer plus the amount of entropy produced from our process, right? So the sigma is related to uh, like a frictional losses, um, things like that. Frictional losses inside of like, you know, turbine blades or like a, uh, a piston cylinder for this one specifically. Since it's a closed system, it'll be a piston cylinder or something like that because it's sliding against the inside of the uh, cylinder. Right, So that'll be frictional losses, and that will be encompassed inside of this term, which is entropy produced. Right, So right here, you are correct. We have S2 minus S1 has to be equal to the amount of entropy coming in from 1 to 2 in terms of heat transfer 
plus entropy production, which is from, you know, from the process, right? So, and that is equation 624. It says where the subscript B signals that the integrand is evaluated at the system boundary. Okay? For the development equation 624, see the box. Uh, that's later on. It is sometimes convenient to use the entropy balance expressed in denture differential form. I don't generally, I, I don't agree with this very often, but <laughs> we're, we're going to read it anyway. It says, note that the differentials of the non-properties Q and sigma are shown, respectively, as uh, dQ or delta Q and delta, is that a delta? I keep seeing delta, but delta Q, delta sigma, when there are no internal irreversibilities. Delta Q vanishes, and equation 625 reduces to 62B. So essentially, if the process is perfect, as in isentropic, um, if there's no frictional losses or anything, this part goes away, right? And then somebody tell me, let's say that this process was, uh, let's say that this process, uh, let's say we were talking about a, a turbine here, right? Let's say I told you that the turbine was 100% uh, efficient. And what if I also told you that the turbine was well insulated? What would, what would that reduce to? What in here would go away? Because, by the way, this is something that will pop up in uh, Chapter 8 and Thermo 2 a lot, like all the time. So <laughs> this is important. So, yes, everything. So essentially, because the process is perfect, there, it's an isentropic, or it's not, because the process has no irreversibilities, sigma uh, would go away. And if I told you that there's no heat transfer across the boundary because it is well insulated or really well insulated, this would go away, which means what? Let's pull this out. This is delta S, which is equal to S2 minus S1. And what that would uh, get changed to is the following. You would then have what? S2 is equal to S1, which represents what type of process? Isentropic, correct. So this is where it comes from. That is this right here is, so whenever in, if in the future, when you do questions in chapter eight and thermo two, like in beyond, uh, whenever it says isentropic, this is what it means. Essentially it means that the process is irrevert, it has no irreversibilities and there is no heat transfer coming in or leaving. And S1 is equal to S2. That is what it means like numerically, right? I showed you graphically using the TS diagram in the last class. So it says in each of its alternative forms, the entropy balance can be regarded as a statement of the second law of thermodynamics. For the analysis of engineering systems, the entropy balance is a more effective means for applying the second law than the Clausius and Kelvin Planck statements given in chapter five. All right. Uh, we are probably not going to do this one right here. So let's move on. And then it says interpreting the closed system energy balance. Uh, they're probably just going to say what I just said. Uh, I haven't actually read this part, but I'm assuming because I can already see it. Interpreting means it, they're going to change some things and tell you what it means in the end. But it says if the end states are fixed, the entropy change on the left side of the equation 624 can be evaluated independent of the details of the process. However, the two terms on the right side depend explicitly on the nature of the process and cannot be determined solely from knowledge of the end states. So what that means is I'll write this equation out. So delta S, this is Q over TB uh, and plus sigma, right? So what they're saying is the following. S1 and S2, so delta S, right? Let's go ahead and write this out are explicitly uh, related to the states, right? Because they are, they are state points. Their S2 is the entropy at state two, and the entropy at state one is S1, which means that these two are evaluated at specific state points, right? Like when it reaches this, this is when we evaluate state two, right? And so these are not due to, these don't worry about the path, right? This does, we don't care about it here. We don't care how we got there. We just know that these are the conditions of state two, 
and this is the entropy at state two, right? Now over here, however, this does actually depend on the process. Like for example, sigma, this one, so sigma, which is the entropy produced, depends on the process, right? If the process is like really inefficient, has a lot of losses, this term will be greater, right? So these things depend on the process. They depend on the path, right? So that's what they were saying, is that essentially the first term on the right side is associated with heat transfer to or from the system during the process. So that's right here, as we said earlier. The direction of entropy transfer is the same as the direction of heat transfer, and the same sign convention applies for heat transfer. A positive value means that the entropy is transferred into the system, and a negative value means that entropy is out of the system. When there is no heat transfer, there is no entropy transfer. And then it says, the entropy change of a system is not accounted for solely by entropy transfer, entropy transfer, but is due in part to the second term on the right side, denoted by a sigma. The term sigma is positive when internal irreversibilities are present during the process and vanishes when there are no internal irreversibilities, right? This can be described by saying that entropy is produced or generated within the system by action of irreversibilities. So this is basically what we just talked about. Uh, so essentially these things right here, uh, these two right here depend explicitly on the path or the process that we take and cannot be determined uh, just from the knowledge of the end states, right? Because remember, Q is, is being added, right? Essentially we have S1 here, Q is being added in between. And so that's part of the path, right? Q, we're, this isn't, Q isn't at an end state, nor is it at a uh, beginning state. It is in the middle somewhere. And so that is, this is a path dependent thing. Like this is in between these from one to two. This is the Q, right? And then we have this one, which is also process dependent because if it's a, you know, perfect process, this goes away. If it's not perfect process, you know, by having a lot of versatilities, it could be higher or lower, right? So these, so this right here, process dependent, this term over here, state dependent, and we know what those states are, right? Well, we should, hopefully. So let's get rid of that. Then it says, the second law of thermodynamics can be interpreted as requiring that entropy is produced by irreversibilities and conserved only in the limit as irreversibilities are reduced to zero. Since sigma measures the effect of irreversibilities present within the system during a process, its value depends on the nature of the process and not solely on the end states. Entropy production is not a property. Okay? So, basically what we just said. And they're going to summarize that here. And it says, when, entropy, when applying the entropy balance to a closed system, it is essential to remember that requirements imposed by the second law on entropy production. The second law requires that entropy production be positive or zero in value. So we talked about this one. I can't remember who brought this up. Somebody said, I don't know who it was. Was it Tanner? I don't even know. One of you guys. Or Joseph. Somebody. The last class. It was Tanner. Anyway. So you guys brought this up. And this right here is essentially what you were asking about. You were asking about, can delta S be negative? Yes. Can delta S be positive? Yes. Can delta S be zero? Yes. But can sigma be zero? Yes. Can it be less than zero? No. It can only ever be greater than zero. Because if it were if it were less than zero, that means that uh, we've removed entropy from the when, from the system. Essentially, we our process, a perfect process, adds no more order. If it, if it was less than zero, that means we have not only not added any more order or disorder, we have removed some. <laughs> so uh, it doesn't really make sense. A process has to do something to it, right? Or else there's no process. Something had to have been done to the fluid or else you didn't do anything. So it says, the value of the entropy production cannot be negative. In contrast, the change in entropy of a system may be positive, negative, or zero. So right here. And it says, like other properties, entropy change for a process between two specified states can be determined without details, uh, knowledges of the details of the process. So, like they reiterated, S2 and S1 are just state dependent. If I told you, you know, T2 is this, T3 
T1 is this, pressure 1 is this, pressure 2 is this, you guys could tell me the entropy, but you guys would have no idea what happened in between, right? You, you would have no idea. It, unless it was described to you, you would have no clue. That's because these two are only dependent on states. Over here, this one, like I said earlier, is dependent on the process because you could not tell me how much entropy was produced unless you knew uh, the type of irreversibilities present. Like how, how do you, or, or the heat transfer coming in. You would have no idea how to tell me. So you would have to know about the process in between states one and two. All right, so then it says, evaluating entropy tr production and transfer. So let me see here. So it says, the objective in many applications of the entropy balance is to evaluate entropy production term. This is true. So this is what you'll be doing mostly. You'll be evaluating entropy production or you'll be evaluating heat transfer. So it's, or, you know, basically it could be anything. You could, you could find delta S, sigma, or Q, but they, they have to give you these other things, right? Like if they give you this and this, you'll probably have to find this, right? So plenty, you just have to know what you're looking for and you have to know the right equation. But essentially that is what you'll be doing in most of your questions. And then it says, however, the value of entropy production for a given process of a system often does not have much significance by itself. The significance is normally determined through comparison. For example, the entropy production within a given component might be compared to the entropy production values of the other components included in an overall system formed by these components. By comparing entropy production values, the components where applicable irreversibilities occur can be identified and rank order. This allows attention to be focused on the components that contribute to most inefficient operations. So essentially what it is saying is the following is that if we have a system, right, I'm just going to draw like a little square here and some weird shapes, right? Uh, I don't know. Let's do a star there and a triangle here. Sure. If I have a, my pictures are great, by the way. So if I do a, if I do a system here and this, this is our system. If we find that this one, if we rank these in terms of like most entropy produced, so if we have one, two, four, and three, right? So if this one right here has the highest entropy produced out of all of these things, you can start looking at it and going, okay, that means that this process is the most inefficient, right? It is the one that causes the most, or has the most irreversibilities. And so we can start determining, is it a, is it a limitation of machines? Are the machines taking place? Is it, you know, um, frictional losses? Is it something that we can change, right? Or is the process that destructive that uh, we just can't change it, right? You have to know these things, and that's why labeling them as the highest ones to lowest ones can often help you uh, get more efficient, right? Like, if let's say, for example, we could then change and make one, uh, you know, now number three, right? That means that we have essentially eliminated a lot of entropy produced and therefore some irreversibilities in our system, which would help us, right? So that's what they're saying here, is that knowing which ones cause the most amount of entropy produced is very helpful to overall efficiency of a cycle. And then it says, to evaluate the entropy transfer uh, term of the entropy balance requires information regarding both the heat transfer and the temperature on the boundary where the heat transfer occurs. The entropy transfer term is not always subject to direct evaluation. However, because the required information, information is either unknown or not defined such as when the system passes through states sufficiently far from equilibrium. In such applications, it may be convenient, therefore, to enlarge the system to include enough of the immediate surroundings that the temperature on the boundary of the enlarged system corresponds to the temperature of the surroundings away from the immediate vicinity of the system. TF. Okay. The entropy transfer term is then simply Q over TF. However, as the irreversibilities present would not just be for the be for the system of interest, but for the enlarged system, the entropy production term would account for the effects of internal irreversibilities within the system and external irreversibilities present within that portion of the surroundings included within the enlarged system. So what that whole jumble just said was, is that uh, I'm gonna draw a little box here. Here's another picture for you guys. So essentially, if we include our uh, our boundary, right? 
let's say our boundary is here, right on the outside of this. And that is what we are including when it comes to T boundary, right? We are including this temperature. What they're saying is, is that sometimes it is good or sometimes convenient to enlarge this, you know, to make it now out here, right, to a higher temperature. But you just have to realize that uh, the sigma term, the entropy, uh, essentially the irreversibilities would now be in a bigger system, right? It would now be out here too. So your irreversibilities would go up. But it's sometimes convenient to do this. Um, trying to think of like when I think I did this in uh, energy management which is another class it's ME440 uh, I'm pretty sure I did this where you enlarge the system and you keep doing uh, balances on it but uh, just to tell you that sometimes that might be the uh, it might be a convenient to do that and then we have applications of the closed system energy balance so we're about to do a uh, problem here in a second. The following example illustrates the use of energy and entropy balances for the analysis of closed systems. Property relations and property diagrams also contribute significantly in developing solutions. Example 6.2 reconsiders the system in end states of 6.1 to demonstrate that entropy is produced when internal irreversibilities are present and that amount of entropy produced is not a property. In example 6.3 the entropy balance is used to determine the minimum theoretical compression work. So this right here um, let me see. There is no heat transfer in the surroundings. Okay, so this right here is a uh, is a it's a similar question to the one we did before. It's re it's rework. So we are going to do this one again now. Let's go ahead. We're going to do two questions today. It looks like we got a little bit of time. So I'm going to need everyone to pay attention just a little bit and also be ready to answer questions. I know it's Friday guys, but we're almost there. So what we are going to do, I'm going to go ahead and uh, we're going to do, uh, I'm going to do this a little bit differently this time. All right, so let's zoom it in. Get more high tech here as we go. So what it says is, is that water, initially I saturated liquid at 150 degrees C. So we're, we're already getting information thrown at us. So we have to be ready here. So let me go ahead and turn down the old font size here. So let's do givens. So given, what were we given? Well, we were given water, right? Water is our working fluid, clearly, from the question. And then it said initially at a saturated liquid of 150 degrees C. So that means that we were given T1 is equal to 150, right? But not only that, what else were we given? Somebody? It was saturated water. Yes, we were given saturated liquid, which means it is under the saturation curve, right? But it's saturated liquid, which means that its quality is zero. And Tanner has already said that. So quality is equal to zero. Because remember, saturated liquid, saturated liquid is zero, quality of zero. Saturated vapor is quality of one. So that's what we were given so far. And it says it was contained in a piston cylinder assembly. So we'll hold on to that in just a minute. It then says the water undergoes a process to the corresponding saturated vapor state. So we were given something else. So we were given X2 is equal to what? 1. Correct. Because we went from saturated liquid to vapor. So this question is the exact same as the one before, except they've changed something in here. They've changed there's no heat transfer and that there's a paddle wheel. So we'll have to watch for that. And it says, during which the piston freely moves within the cylinder. So we have went from T1, although T1 is equal to T2, and we'll prove that in just a minute. And then it says, there is no heat transfer with the surroundings. So that means that Q is then equal to zero, right? No heat transfer with the surroundings. 
And then it also says, if the change in state of state is brought about by the action of a paddle wheel, determine the net work per unit mass in kilojoules per kilogram and the amount of entropy produced per unit mass in kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. So what we are trying to find is the following. We are trying to find work of the paddle wheel. So work of the paddle wheel, so work. And we are also trying to find uh, sigma, which is uh, entropy produced, right? So this is what we were given. Now, before we start, we're going to get into a better habit here, or I'm going to get into a better habit. We are going to do a uh, TS diagram really fast. So, TS diagram will be done right here. All right, so we have temperature and entropy right here. And I'm going to draw this sort of well, hopefully. Okay. So now, where will we put state one? It doesn't really matter. This is arbitrary, wherever you draw this line. But let's say we draw the line here where temperature is 150. Where are we putting state one? It will be right on the top of that are going to be the next thing from zero to going to be right on the left portion of the hump there. So right here is what you're saying. Correct. Correct. The quality of quality of x one at one fifty is zero. Yes. So we are right here for our first day, and our temperature is equal to one fifty right here. Okay, now it says that the water undergoes a process to the corresponding saturated vapor state during which the piston moves freely. So that means what? That means that during this process, where is our final state on here? It's at the right, right boundary, boundary of the, of the attributed region. region. So right here with a straight line. So essentially, what happened here, and uh, we're going to get uh, what has happened. So I'm going to draw this up here at the top. Is that during this time, while let's say, uh, I'm going to say this right here is the uh, uh, piston. So what happened was, is that there was a, uh, some sort of, device in here, a paddle wheel. So I'm just going to draw this, right? Essentially what it did was it stirred this up, right? Bunch of energy being put into it, right? Because obviously from if you spin the hell out of this, you're adding energy to the system, right? Um, in the form of like kinetic, right? Something like that. You're just spinning it, you're adding a bunch of energy to it. And what's what happened was is, is that as that as that happened, uh, the piston then moved up it slid upward, right? And what happened was is, is that because it slid upward, uh, the pressure was allowed to, because remember, as this, uh, as this turns into a saturated vapor, its volume grows, right? Volume grows, and that means it pushed the cylinder upward, so the pressure stayed the same, the temperature stayed the same, except now what's in here is just saturated vapor. So, let me just do that. So this is now where we're at. So this is what happened in this. And there was, like I said, it was a, there was a spin here. But I'm not very good at drawing that. So we're just going to draw a little swirly there. It spun. So now, and this would be state one, this would be state two. So now that we know that, and we know how the process was done on a TS diagram, and we also know what it looks like in general, now we can go and start finding things. So what's the first thing we should do? I'm going to start with state one. What is the first thing we should accomplish here? Anybody? T1 is equal to 150. X1 is equal to 0, right? Uh, we'll so, start by, by bar the values, values of the table, table to like, like a, a specific volume, volume and, and then, uh, uh, specific entry. Yep, I agree. So basically, we go right to the tables, and this was for water. 
and we are in the water tables right here, saturated liquid water, and we were given a temperature to start. So we go to the temperature table, which is A2, and we slide over here, and this is the line that we're supposed to read. So this right here is uh, the pressure. This right here is the saturated liquid volume. So we are going to take this value. This is the saturated liquid uh, internal energy. So we're gonna take that value as well. And then over here, this is the saturated liquid specific entropy value. So we're going to take all three of those. So let me do that while I uh, get rid of this. So I'm gonna move this over so I can actually read it. But I will do it. So we have S1 is equal to 1.8418. U1 is equal to 631.68. And then the last one is V1, which is 0 0.001905. And uh, I'm going to just leave it unitless for now because I accidentally zoomed out of the screen and it was hard to read. But if you want to know, uh, entropy, kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin, internal energy, kilojoules per kilogram, and volume, meters cubed per kilogram, or specific volume, that is. So that's state one. So we have now found all the values that we want from state one, right? We have found it all. Everything that we needed. Now, although there's still some one thing maybe we needed that we didn't write down. Somebody tell me what we might need here. Well, we haven't found specific. We haven't, we haven't moved on to state two. We're talking about state one. So Tanner says pressure. Why do you say pressure? So we can find work. Okay. So let's uh, let's do that. We'll go ahead and grab that. So four point seven five eight. I should remember that since it was the exact same question as before. But 4.758, so I'm gonna go ahead and put that down here. So P1 is 4.758, it is also the same as P2. 758 bar. So that's state one. Now let's move on to state two. So right here, state two. So what are we doing in state two? Michael, you said something just a minute ago. What are we doing? You said specific volume at state uh, state two was what? Uh, zero point three nine nine eight eight. Zero point three. Okay, yeah. So right here. So point three nine two eight. Gotcha. Correct. Correct. So. 0.3928, got it. And then we have the other ones, which are, go to 150, slide across, 2559.5. So U2 is 255.5. And then the last one was six point something. I just don't recall what it was. 6.8379, got it. 6.8379, okay. So these are now we have every we have all the values that we need, right? Would you guys agree? I think that is uh, fairly straightforward. We have basically everything that we need. So now we need to start doing some other things, right? Start doing some other things. So it says we need to determine the network per unit mass in kilojoules per kilogram. Okay. So let's go see if we're right so far, because I do want to be right, of course. So, oh, so it says, as the volume of the system increases during the process, there is an energy transfer by work from the system during the expansion, as well as energy transfer by work to the system via the paddle. So we do have to be careful here, okay? Because if you recall here, we now have two different things of work. We have this paddle, which we had to input energy in, right? We had to put energy in for this paddle to spin. While also, since this piston moved upward by its own 
accord, right? Because of the ga expansion of the gases or the expansion of the vapor, that means what? It means that there is work going out of the system when we get to this state right here in between the state. So we have two different sets of work, right? Two sets. We have in and going out, which is why it said the network per unit mass. So when it says the network per unit mass, that means we're looking for what? We are looking for the amount of work that we put in and add the amount of work that we left, or the opposite way, where the amount of work we made minus the amount of work that we had to put in, right? That's what we're looking for the network. So let's go back here. So uh, let's pull this up, sorry. Does anybody have any ideas about what we're gonna do next though? I'll leave this here at the bottom just to like, you know, maybe someone uh, get some help. Anybody have any ideas? So right here, this is an energy balance, right? So we have gotten rid of kinetic potential. We have no heat from the system. So delta U is equal to negative work, right? So we have that. So let's go up here and let's do our values in that. So let's go ahead and let's do part A. I'll just write part A here. Part A. So we have uh, U2 minus U1 is equal to negative work, right? And if we put our numbers in there, we get 2559.5 minus 631.68 is equal to negative work, or we're just gonna put a negative, yeah, negative W, sure. And what that gets us, when I get my calculator out here, is 2559.5 minus 631.68 is negative, okay, that's definitely not true. Uh, 2559.5 minus 631.68. Yeah, I forgot a, an extra number there. So it's 1927. So that means negative work is equal to negative 1927.82. And this would be in terms of kilojoules per kilogram, right? So we have found that work is equal to that, okay? So that right there, what, so what work is that? It says this is a network, right? That's the work we had that, that was put in by the paddle. paddle. Yes. So it says here, as the volume expands, there is an energy transfer by work from the system during the expansion, as well as an energy transfer by work to the system via the paddle. The network can be evaluated from an energy balance, which reduces to this. So right here, um, this right here is the actual network of the system because we have taken all of it into account, right? Essentially, we, we, know, that the, uh, we know that the end state, so we, let's think about this, right, for just a second. We know that the end state here represents how much energy, because uh, remember, inside of here, in this, in, these, in this vapor, we know that uh, at state two, it is a higher level of energy, right? We are now at the vapor. Over here, we were at the uh, saturated liquid, right? So essentially, these two states represent the energy that was put into it, right? Let's move on to part B, and then I'll explain that in just a second. So then it says, the amount of entropy produced is evaluated by piling the entropy balance. So we have to use that entropy balance equation that we did before. So S2 minus S1 is equal to uh, the integral. So I'm going to do uh, int because I don't know another better way to do that over TB plus, and that's from 1 to 2, by the way. I don't know another way of doing it. So it was this right here. So this was our entropy balance from the previous one. S2 minus S1 is equal to the integral of QTB plus sigma, okay? So what we are trying to find here is we are trying to find sigma, right? 
uh, we're trying to find the entropy produced per unit mass. So is there something that goes away here? No heat transfer, correct. So that means that this whole part goes and we are left with, I don't know why I'm using this, <laughs> using the, uh, the on-screen tool instead of the one from here. So we are left with the following. We are left with S2 minus S1 is equal to sigma, right? So if we are looking for uh, the entropy produced, it just comes down to this, right? It's whatever the differences between them had to have been produced by the process. So let's go back here and let's see them do it. So you get sigma is equal to S2 minus S1. And if you plug in our values, which uh, we may do that right now, uh, where'd we get that at? So it's 6.8379 minus uh, 1.8418. Eh, let's see. I need one of you guys to be my calculator. What do I pay you for? Oh wait, I don't pay you for anything. Uh, four. Yep. Kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. Okay, so there are our answers right there. Now.